The students, dear guests, welcome to the third lecture of our joint seminar, Global Governance and the Role of Cities. This course is a partnership between the Global Awareness Education at the University of Tübingen in Germany and the Federal University of ABC in Brazil. In this course, we will address various perspectives on the topic, such as challenges faced by big cities, sustainable cities, migration, and health issues. We will have guests from different countries and contexts to contribute with lectures, which will be interspersed with more practical classes in which students will do case studies on Latin American, African, and Asian big cities. In both universities, the course is offered to students of different disciplines and to begin as part of transdisciplinary course program and at the Federal University of ABC as a free extension course. The course organizers are Professor Gilberto Rodriguez, Federal University of ABC, and me, Dr. Glaucia Perez da Silva, University of Tübingen. Today, we will hear a lecture on paradiplomacy with Professor Gilberto Rodriguez from the Federal University of ABC. He's professor and head of the graduate program in international relations and a researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil. He also coordinates the nucleus for the study of federalism and local government at the UFABC. And his research interests include international organizations, global issues and local governments, international cooperation, paradiplomacy, and federative foreign policy. He's a member of the advisory board of federal governments. Tibet, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, my colleague, Dr. Glossa Perez da Silva. It's a great pleasure uh, today to uh, address the issue of paradiplomacy in our course on global governance and the role of cities. I would like to begin saying that um, the idea today is to give you an overview on the issue of paradiplomacy. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, an issue that uh, there are a lot of things uh, to, to address, but I understand that uh, regarding our purpose for this course that the idea is to give you a, a, a more broad uh, uh, overview on the issue. Uh, um, I know that some of you are not familiar with the issues and some of you are more familiar, uh, some of the students in the course, but uh, of course that we are targeting not only uh, people here, but also a more uh, wide audience that we, we expect to uh, to talk uh, and to establish a dialogue. In this first picture, you can see uh, a, on the right side uh, a picture of our Federal University of ABC, São Bernardo do Campo campus, the campus where I am here today. In, this, in the campus, the campus now is open after more than two years of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now we are uh, in presence in the campus and the campus uh, is uh, again with uh, the faculty and students. So we're very happy of this. Uh, the, our, my, my lecture uh, is uh, based on a, a book that I published very recently, uh, last year, uh, on the, the, in Portuguese, the title is Para Diplomacia, Cidades e Estados na Cena Global. In English, we can translate like Para Diplomacy, Cities and States in the Global Arena. Uh, based on this book uh, and, and eight central questions that we offer uh, to discuss Para Diplomacy, based on that, uh, I prepared this conference and uh, after all, I would be at your disposal to any queries or the discussion that will follow our conference. Um, but before uh, we, we go into the questions, I would like again to say hello for everyone because I think I, I, I said before the transmission now, 
to be polite, I'd like to give you my uh, compliments for everyone who is uh, following us. So you can see here the in the slide the, the questions in Portuguese, but we translated all of them and then we will follow uh, in detail uh, some uh, responses for each of these questions. The first question is, what's the difference between diplomacy and paradiplomacy? Of course, that you, uh, even, even if you are not a uh, specialist or even if you are not uh, studying international relations, you know what is diplomacy because diplomacy is a very common word and we often use including for interrelationship some somebody's a diplomat is because he or she knows how to behave with others but in terms uh, more specific terms uh, in international law in, in international relations when you talk about diplomacy we are talking about nations we are talking about the relations between nations and then we have to to recognize that there are some norms there are some rules of international law very consolidated uh, from from centuries ago uh, after the westphalian system was established between nations in the 17th century we have been following the development of what we call diplomacy there you find diplomats but also national officials that work with diplomats uh, in the ministries in embassies in representations to international organizations and consulates this is diplomacy but when you talk about para diplomacy we are talking and, and if we take the, the concept in a more broad concept uh, then we will talk about subnational governments, non-state actors, unions, companies, NGOs, social movements, so on and so forth. Uh, in our case, we will focus on subnational governments, not because only uh, it's not to do it's not to do only with our preference, it's because para diplomacy as a concept has evolved much more related to subnational governments like cities, like states, federative states, like provinces, cantons, London, etc. And that's why we will focus on that. Uh, what is important to say at this point? There is no international law regulation uh, for para diplomacy, but we, we, yes, we have some national norms and regional regimes like the, like European Union, like Merco, uh, Sul reg uh, regimes that uh, give some boundaries, legal, political, for this uh, phenomenon. Uh, can you say para diplomats? Yeah, we can say para diplomats, but most or maybe some of of those people who work on this field sometimes. They doesn't. Uh, they do not like to be called para, para diplomats, and others don't mind about that. But we are talking about politicians, public officials, technicians, academics that are involved, that are working with para diplomacy. Uh, we we can also uh, stress uh, or underline that uh, there are some organs. Uh, in, from which para diplomacy uh, is developed, like international relations secretaries, advisory organs, departments, representation offices, linked to cities, provinces, states, and other terminologies that we can call subnational governments. Here you can see a famous, uh, at least in Brazil, famous uh, paint based on a picture. Uh, of Roosevelt, uh, former U.S. president, and Getúlio Vargas, uh, former Brazilian president, uh, in the Natal base in the north of uh, Brazil in 1943, during the, war, uh, the Second World War, 
when Roosevelt and Vargas met uh, to uh, make an agreement uh, in order to in order to Brazil to to enter in the Second World War. Uh, I show this picture. Vargas in, is in the back. Roosevelt is in the front of the car. Uh, it's because this is diplomacy. This is high level diplomacy, what we call in general terms. But we can see also another picture, uh, and this picture uh, represents part of diplomacy. It's a meeting of mayors. Uh, it's a Merco City's meeting in Sao Paulo City Hall, 2015. Uh, then in this picture, you, in, the, in the building of Sao Paulo Mall, you, uh, City Hall, you see all those people who are mayors and secretary of international relations of those cities. So this is another kind of uh, diplomacy, which is para-diplomacy. Uh, let's take a definition of para-diplomacy. And I like the definition of Professor Noé Cornago from the Basque University in Spain, uh, because uh, Professor Cornago is one of the most important and well-known academicians uh, devoted to the uh, paradiplomacy field. He, ha he has um, produced a lot of uh, theory and a lot of works on that, and also is a good friend of us and uh, is uh, one of the heads of the paradiplomacy community in academia. Let's see what uh, Professor Cornago says on paradiplomacy. The ability to conduct di diplomatic relations is generally considered an exclusive attribute of sovereign states, but the participation of local and regional governments in international relations is becoming increasingly important worldwide. This phenomenon, also known as paradiplomacy, has important historical antecedents, but has acquired in recent decades a new preeminence as a result of the transnationalization of the global economy and the rise of global connectivity. Paradiplomacy is always a form of political agency that facilitates the representation of collective identities at a global scale, expressing generally a will of greater political autonomy. Uh, this is, I think, a very comprehensive concept of paradiplomacy, and I think it's uh, good to begin with that so we can, uh, at the very start of this uh, presentation, have an idea, uh, a general idea of what paradiplomacy is. It's important also to talk about terminology because we are in a field where terminology uh, has no consensus. We have some consensus uh, when we talk about paradiplomacy in very ger general terms in English language. When we say paradiplomacy, when we publish something on paradiplomacy using this word, we can be recognized in all parts of the world because the term, the, this terminology is now well known. But uh, at the same time, some academicians, uh, and th uh, and this uh, has to do with different um, reasons, uh, have no exception, have no um, agreement on the use of paradiplomacy as a concept of a certain kind of um, subnational action. So we can see paradiplomacy. Uh, we have two dates here, uh, 1986 and 1990, because uh, the term was uh, began to be used on the political science um, in the US uh, by some of the academicians that were working on uh, political science and international relations, especially on the very broad uh, interdependence paradigm, uh, where, uh, which is a very broad field that we uh, consider 
in, in international relations in, op in opposition to the realist paradigm, which uh, is much more uh, um, centered in the state as, a, as the central government. Uh, we also have the expression international relations of subnational governments. Uh, we have, and this in Europe is much more used than in other places, the expression decentralized cooperation uh, because, of, uh, because of the, the nature of, of the different nature of, of countries in Europe Union. Because if you were talking, if you talk about uh, Germany, you are, we will talk about a federal country. But if you talk about France, we are talking about a unitary country. So to accommodate the differences between European Union, they prefer uh, countries of European Union prefer, and the very European Union prefers to talk about decentralized cooperation. This expression. Uh, at some point was uh, began also to be used in Latin America because of the, the, the connections between and, uh, Latin American countries and also uh, the interconnections between uh, both subnational governments of both regions. We also have in Brazil the expression that was uh, begun to be used by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Federative Diplomacy. And we have also the expression very well known, city diplomacy, which is used in many parts of the world, but it, uh, it relates much more to cities, not, not uh, to states or provinces, it's, it's more focused on cities, or urban diplomacy, especially after the uh, conference of Habitat, uh, UN Habitat uh, in Ecuador, Quito in 2016, the expression became to be more used uh, in international relations. And also we have subnational diplomacy. I, I would point out to you that uh, there are, uh, this is not a close uh, 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 presentation of expressions of terminology. There are other terminologies that we could uh, put here, but I will close in this list, but it's not the closed list, it's, it's an open one. Then we go to the second question, uh, which I tried to answer in my book, as I pointed out in the beginning to you. Why are cities and states, or we can say provinces, region, lander, etc., active in international relations? The reason why. We have, we can say that, uh, we have three main reasons for that. And these three main reasons were very concentrated during the 80s. The globalization process, uh, especially when we see the economy and liberalization of economy. And this, is, uh, this was very a strong process uh, in Latin America, especially in, in, in the liberalization process uh, was in, already uh, in action, uh, but not in Latin America or maybe Africa too. The other reason is democracy, and we can say democratization process. This, with democratization process, then we have we had decentralization, and we have also devolution of competences from the central government to subnational governments. And we also have the integration process, which uh, uh, was um, follow, follow the uh, globalization process during the 90s and were, were very well established with the European Union that substituted the European community during the 90s with the Maastricht Treaty in 92. But also in Latin America, we had Merco, uh, Mercosur uh, with the Treaty of Asuncion uh, in 1981, establishing a new economic and political bloc and those integration process. They favor at some point the relations with subnational governments too. The other reasons uh, we, can, we can underline 
regarding of each subnational entity. Because each of, uh, when you see subnational entities, the history, the, their culture, then we can see that uh, some of those subnational governments in many parts of the world, they are more uh, favored to go uh, beyond borders, to go uh, as international relations actors because of their own history, because of their own uh, uh, situation on political, economic, and history. Uh, we are talking about idiosyncrasies of each of the subnational governments. And I'd like to recall the author called Michael Keating, because Michael Keating, during the nights, uh, in, in his theorization of pirate diplomacy, he pointed out that uh, uh, the reasons, he, he considered that there were three reasons, main reasons that could uh, put uh, uh, or favor the subnational government to go uh, through paradiplomacy. One is political, the other is economical, and, and the third is cultural. Then uh, we can fight all three, or we can fight one of them uh, as, as a reason, or as a main reason for uh, paradiplomacy in subnational governments. The other has to do with identity action. And uh, there, are, uh, there is a very recent literacy regarding paradiplomacy, uh, which is now trying to discuss in, uh, in a more deeper uh, way the identity of subnational governments and, and how this identity favors paradiplomacy. And we can, uh, we can uh, say, uh, as an example, uh, uh, Quebec in, in Canada, or Ca Catalonia in Spain, or uh, Scotland in Great Britain, and or Flanders in Belgium, and, and others we can we can mention uh, afterwards. The other reason uh, is a very strong one: is climate change or environment in general, but climate change in particular as a reason for paradigm diplomacy. We will see uh, forward this uh, slide uh, in the last question, we will see how environment and particularly climate change uh, has favored uh, a paradigm diplomacy in, in a more broad uh, scenario, not only in the global north, but also in the global south. And then, health, san sanitary, and COVID-19 pandemic is a more recent uh, reason for paradiplomacy. And we have been following this movement in the last two, two years, two years and a half. And we saw a lot of developments from paradiplomacy related to health and sanitary issues. And finally, we can uh, point out that uh, there are two main vectors that uh, could be developed through paradiplomacy. One is bilateral, uh, city to city, uh, province to province, uh, what we call uh, horizontal paradiplomacy. But also we can uh, we can mention the multilateral relations that also are very important, very present in paradiplomacy action through the networks, the city networks, and uh, through the United Nations systems and, and the regional process. Now we can see the three, uh, the, the third uh, question, uh, how are city networks formed and sustained? Uh, as I pointed out in the previous slide, multilateral relations is very important for paradiplomacy, and especially for cities, I would say. But they are not so recent as maybe one of uh, we can imagine that uh, seeing, uh, looking at the networks today. But in the past, we had the great cities. The great cities, they, uh, at some point, they established networks um, 
uh, we, we study them like confederations of cities in the past, we are talking about 500 before Christ. Uh, then we had in the Middle Ages a very important uh, network, the Hanseatic League. Uh, the Hanseatic League in the north of Europe uh, encompassed, encompassed um, cities from what we today is uh, Belgium and Netherlands and Germany uh, until uh, the uh, the Poland or the Nordic countries. It was a very huge territory in, in which the Hanseatic League acted, and it was a real network of cities that played a very important role, especially in, in the pre-capitalist period, in the mercantilist period, because those cities uh, had uh, one of their most important tasks uh, taking this network uh, wor uh, work was the uh, trade, was trade. We were very interested in the trade uh, and, and the, the Hanseatic League, League had this role. Today we have di very different international networks. We can say uh, in, in more, we can see one more general like uh, the, the UC UCLG uh, in Barcelona, which is the, the most uh, comprehensive uh, international network of cities, uh, and also Metropolis, uh, the, uh, Metropolis uh, also with headquarters in Barcelona, which is a network uh, that connected uh, big cities, you know, like, like uh, world cities or like global cities. Um, you see this in, in, in Poland. Then we, we also have uh, environment and climate change networks like C uh, C40 plus because uh, the C40 began with 40 cities, uh, but today it's almost 100. So we call now C plus uh, C40 plus and the ICLEI, which is a, a, a very specialized uh, network uh, of cities uh, regarding environment, biodiversity, and climate change, uh, with headquarters, the ICLEI is headquarters in Bonn, Germany, and C40 in New York. New York. And we also have regional networks uh, like EuroCities, which is a very hu a, a huge uh, network of uh, European cities, and MercoCities. Uh, in South America, not only related to Mercosur, but also with South America is, is more comprehensive than Mercosur. Here you can see a map of the Hanseatic League, and then you can see, you, you can have uh, an idea of the territory that the Hanseatic League covered during more than 400 years, I'm saying, to, to you 400 years. It was a, a, a very long uh, existence, uh, existence uh, of this network. And uh, when the, the nation state became to be more stronger, then the Hanseatic League became to be uh, less than it was. Here, it's a... Um, uh, it's a uh, new uh, from the city of Sao Paulo uh, site uh, saying that Sao Paulo was elected member of the uh, advisory board of the Metropolis uh, Network. This is only to, to give you uh, an example of uh, the day by day relations uh, that cities had with those networks, international networks, and how uh, it's part of the public administration, uh, uh, in, the, in this case of Sao Paulo, but we can, we can imagine of many other cities. Uh, the fourth question is, how does the global agenda relate to local entities or governments? 
we can we know that we have global local relations and we already saw that in different uh, literature literature about that um, the, the the international agenda the more global agenda uh, is not uh, alone is not isolated uh, from what happening what happens at the local level then we can uh, very easy easily to say that we we, we can uh, find uh, global local relations in many fields uh, that we can imagine uh, as you already know, uh, Professor Saskia Sassin, who was uh, with us uh, in the very beginning of this course, uh, wrote uh, his, uh, her uh, PhD thesis on global cities uh, during uh, in the year of 1990, and then she published a book on this uh, concept of global cities. And global cities represent probably the the most concrete example of uh, the interconnection between the global and the local agenda uh, but moreover we have international organizations in local governance as we as we know uh, we have in the united nations system the habitat program which ha has to do with um, local settlements and cities uh, most most of, of the, the work of Habitat Program has to do with cities, but also we have the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, uh, which agenda has a lot of to do with local governments, cities, and, and regions. We also have the World Bank, uh, uh, which is a one of the most important agencies of the United Nations system, uh, and from the 80s, uh, I would say, especially from the 80s, the World Bank, World Bank ha ha has uh, been in touch directly with cities and regions in all over the world. Of course, that it depends on the national legal and political system, the, the level of relations that the World Bank has with subnational governments is deeper, uh, uh, in, especially in democracies. Uh, when the, the state is not a democracy or is a formal democracy, not a substantial democracy, of course, that the agencies of the United Nations system are more careful about this uh, kind of direct relations. But uh, in democracies, it's very now is uh, used to, the World Bank used to have uh, direct relations with the national governments. The UNESCO, you know, uh, with headquarters in Paris uh, that uh, is related to science, education, culture. And inside the UNESCO, there is a very important uh, project related to the heritage, the local heritage. So uh, UNESCO uh, can uh, declare that uh, a specific city or a set of cities uh, could be declared a humanity uh, heritage. And this is very important uh, to establish global local relations because it depends very much on the local, on the local uh, on the cities uh, to preserve the heritage, of course, that they need the, the money, the support from the national government, but, but locally, the, the mayors are, are, are responsible, including internationally responsible for this, those preservation of those uh, heritage at the local level. So it's very interesting uh, to see uh, that in many cases, uh, a hum, uh, hum, humanity heritage has to do with the work of a locality of a city. And also we can mention the UNCR, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, which is, uh, ha have a very, has a very important work on communities, on cities to receive and integrate uh, refugees or uh, forced migrants in general. 
And there are, in Latin America, we have a very important project called uh, Solidarity Cities uh, in connection and with agreement with the UNCR in which the UNCR directly have a, a, has a relationship with the cities uh, through an agreement to support cities uh, to develop uh, public policies at local level to integrate or to better integrate uh, refugees and forced migrants uh, in those cities. Here you see uh, an example of a ranking uh, of global cities here, the top 30 cities in the global cities index. Um, the, the idea of global cities has evolved and has gone beyond the academic uh, environment to enter the private sector and uh, especially the business uh, community. And the business community and the private sector takes very seriously those kind of indexes that shows uh, many kinds of variables related to cities. In this case, the is a global cities index that shows uh, based on that Saskia's concept of global cities, which are the cities that we could call global cities. Uh, and this is very important for a foreign investment, for instance, because a foreign investment used to, um, or foreign in investors used to, to like to put uh, their money on those, those uh, global cities because there are a lot of possibilities of uh, gain uh, uh, profit on that. The fifth question is what interests do international organizations have in local entities or authorities and vice versa? It's important to underline that this movement, it, movement is not uh, from up to down, but also to down to up. So it's a kind of dialectic uh, movement in which both international organizations and localities, cities and provinces and states are interested in this uh, relationship. Uh, one in interesting thing that we can uh, think about with, and pay attention a little bit more on that, that we today we have international public policies. Public policy is not anymore an issue that happens in the national country, in the national, inside the national border. We also have, and maybe we can say that uh, from 30 years ahead, we have been uh, facing a new kind of public policy, which is international. Is uh, uh, because it's international, it applies to many different places. We will, you can see, uh, and then we have a, a, a cross um, a crossroad between international relations, public policies, political science, law, and different economy, economy different uh, fields cross on, on, on public policies when we talk about international public policy. And the United Nations uh, system has a lot of to do with that because in, in different agencies, we can see the production, the elaboration of uh, international public policies, but those elaborations are not isolated from the localities, from the cities, from the province, from the states, from the regions. So the, 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 there, there has been a dialogue very intense, very deep and uh, a direct dialogue between the international agencies, both the international from UN system or uh, also from the regional systems like the European Union, Mercosur, etc., et in order to elaborate international public policies. Another uh, field is the field of loans, because as we know, the World Bank, uh, they can give loans to uh, tech, for technical assistance, 
assistance, they can give loans for different kinds of projects. And also the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank in, the, in Latin America, which is a very important bank uh, to foster development in the region. So uh, when we see the negotiations today regarding loans, you see very easily a mayor going to Washington in the World Bank and also in the, in the IDB headquarters, which is uh, also in Washington, D.C. They go there to negotiate with those agencies loans for finance uh, local development. No? Uh, each nation, each state has uh, uh, different uh, legal political frameworks to deal with those uh, movements. In the case of Brazil, I can tell you, I can say to you that uh, the Senate, which is uh, the, what we call the upper chamber, they, by constitution, the, the Senate has the competence to approve a loan of a city of a state, a federative state. So the city or the federative state, they can negotiate directly a loan. They, they have to have the approval also from the union, uh, but the approval, the final approval uh, should be from the Senate. But of course, that depending on the country, it differs because it depends on the constitution, depends on the legal system of each country. Uh, finally, we can see in this uh, fifth question, the uh, sustainable development goals or the global agenda, which is very interesting, the, the SDG, because the SDG, uh, they offer a, like a picture uh, that puts together the international and the local agendas. And we have the, also the SDG localization process, which is a very specific process to implement the SDG agenda through the identification of uh, each of, uh, of, of, of of one of the objectives of 17 objectives uh, that are, is already uh, existent in localities. So it's a very interesting uh, process that link it, uh, the international agencies and the local uh, authorities. And here you can see it's in Portuguese, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know the, the sustainable uh, development goals uh, which is in different languages, the seven things of them. Uh, the 60 uh, question, we are going to uh, the final, uh, to the final part of our presentation. From where does private diplomacy derive its legitimacy and legality? This is very, I would say it's very important uh, question, uh, especially when we talk about the theory, but also when you talk about practice of paradigmacy. First, when you talk about legitimacy, we can talk about the, the broad, uh, comprehensive understanding that we already know that uh, there are different international relations actors. We cannot say anymore that state is the only even in some circumstances, the most important actor. We have different actors, as you know, public sector companies uh, and uh, subnational governments, NGOs, social movements, so on and so forth. But then we have uh, an opposition between autonomy versus sovereignty. Many uh, jurists and many uh, diplomats and also people who work uh, in the international organizations, different systems, they say subnational governments uh, have autonomy, but the national state has sovereignty. So there are differences. I was mentioned to you that we all know that there are uh, different actors in international relations. One of those actors are subnational governments. And there is a kind of uh, difference between autonomy and sovereignty. Uh, when we, we study, when we see 
the relations uh, uh, from subnational governments we used to say that they have autonomy but they don't have sovereignty because sovereignty is reserved for central governments for the union this is a phenomena uh, all over the world uh, with some exceptions that we find in very specific countries i would say switzerland for instance or belgium or even germany where where uh, in those countries, the constitution uh, has pr uh, specific provisions for land or for regions to uh, establish uh, international relations by them, uh, themselves, by their own means. But of course, that all those uh, uh, relations should be in partnership, uh, not isolated, uh, with the foreign policy. We will see uh, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in another slide this in a more detail. Uh, another thing, another important uh, thing to, to say about the, this autonomy versus sovereignty, uh, let's say, difference is what Alain, uh, Alain Gagnon uh, called le choc de légitimité. De légitimité. The shock of legitimacy, or the the shock of legitimacy, because if we have a, a subnational government with a certain level of legitimacy in democracies, it's very well recognized the legitimacy of the autonomous uh, possibility to act, to have their own constitutions, legal, political, economic, the territory the jurisdiction, everything is very well consolidated. Uh, but the union or the central government also has its legitimacy. And in some cases, we can see a, a kind of shock between legitimacies. And this is very interesting. It's part of the discussions of the literature in paradiplomacy to find out how we can solve or prevent this, those shots of legitimacy and how the international institutions and the national institutions, of course, could play a role to, to prevent or to resolve those kind of shocks. But they exist and maybe they will be uh, much more common than we, we see today. Now, the other issue is related to national history, the constitution, the recognized rights and practices. Uh, if, for instance, if the German constitution has in Article 30, 32 the possibility for the lander to uh, establish agreements with other uh, entities in other, uh, with other countries, other national governments in cultural, in scientific uh, or technique or technique uh, issues, this has to do. This has to do with the history of Germany, because uh, it has to do with the, the unification of Germany. It has to do with the history of each of the lander in Germany, and it happens also in Switzerland in other countries. Um, but uh, it's not, let's say, a phenomenon that we can see in in all all the countries. We can see in some countries this historic. Uh, heritage that was preserved in terms of rights and the constitution used to uh, declare uh, that right, those rights that could be ex exercised by the, the subnational governments um, preserved. Uh, another thing that I'd like to mention uh, regarding legitimacy is about national associations. Because every country uh, has their own national association of cities or states or provinces. In the case of Brazil, we have, a, for instance, a network of uh, uh, organs or bodies of international relations of cities, which we, we call FONARI, which is a, is a terminology in Portuguese, to represent this network of different uh, secretaries and advisories in international relations. 
Another one is the Forum uh, International Relations 27, uh, which has to do with federative states, is, is uh, related to states. In Brazil, we have 26 states plus the federal district. Um, by coincidence, uh, our colleague Alice, who is with us here, she was uh, she supported the secretariat of the, in the beginning of the forum uh, international relations 27 because it was establishing the state of Santa Catarina where uh, Alice worked uh, some years ago. I mentioned that because then we can also make some questions for for, for her afterwards. Um, we also, it's important also to mention uh, regarding legitimacy uh, that we, we will find international uh, and UN platforms in Habitat program and regional platforms too, like the Committee of Regions at the, in the European Union and the uh, Foro Consultivo, which is in Portuguese, Foro Consultivo uh, the, of uh, Cities, the Consultative Forum of Cities, States, Provinces, and Departments of Mercosur. This is very important to mention that those bodies, those uh, international or regional bodies, they offer a level of legitimacy to local uh, cities, to, to states, because it's... Um, uh, their their uh, function has to do with uh, it's a body that functions with cities, with states, with provinces. So there is a link, direct a direct link between cities, provinces, and states with those regional bodies of the European Union. In the case of of the Committee of Regions, which was established with the Treaty of Maastricht in ninety two, and also in the case of Mercosur. The, the forum, uh, the consultative forum was established with a uh, resolution of Mercosur 2004 and was implemented in 2007. Uh, for me, these uh, different bodies in regional process, they conferred a very strong message of legitimacy for the autonomous, uh, uh, of the autonomy for local and regional uh, actors uh, play uh, as in part of diplomacy, you know. Now, talking about legality, another vector important, uh, and uh, we already mentioned about constitutions, which, which are very, the most important document, uh, legally speaking, in countries. Uh, we used to have in all constitutions, uh, different systems, uh, the common law or the, the Roman French system uh, or the Asian systems, we used to have what we call share or concurrent competences. What, what, what are shared competences? It's a competence that either municipalities, either states and either the union, they should play a role either. Uh, there is no exclusive competence for those issues regarding shared competences. I give you an example, environment. Environment maybe is the best example of a shared competence. It has to do uh, that the constitution says it's uh, an obligation for the union, for the states or for municipalities to preserve the environment. So all, all of the different subnational governments plus the union has the obligation, they all have the obligation to play a role in the environment. Of course, that this system of shared competences, we, we can find this in, in, as I mentioned to you, in different countries, they need a coordination, which is uh, used to be in the union's hands, the coordination of the policies, but also we, we, we should have some um, mechanisms of international uh, intergovernmental relations, mechanisms that put together states with cities and the union. And we can see these mechanisms formal, formally or informally. 
depends on the country, we will find uh, a different uh, perspective of those, but they have to exist. It's very important to make the system works. Then we have expressive competences that give uh, to some, at some point, or at some uh, certain uh, kind of uh, policy that allow, allow, allow for uh, national governments to play a role in international relations. I already mentioned the Article 32 of the German Constitution. Uh, we, you find different uh, possibilities. In Argentina, they also changed it, it's, uh, this constitution, the Argentinian constitution, uh, in 1994. And in Argentina, they changed it to allow provinces to uh, negotiate and uh, sign agreements. But, uh, well, I will not go into details. That's only to mention to you because it's a little bit complicated complex to explain that in Argentina doesn't work too much this, uh, but it's in the constitution, but it's different from the German, uh, Austrian and Belgian system, which have been working for some years. Uh, but it's also important to mention that sometimes uh, it lacks regulation or a clear, clear regulation uh, for paradiplomacy in uh, the legal and political system in some countries. Uh, maybe we can say that most of the countries do not have a clear regulation or even a regulation for that. It's the case of Brazil, we don't have uh, this kind of uh, regulation. Um, let's see here. Now, the seventh question, can citizen states, provinces, regions, cantons, etc., have foreign policy. Uh, I would like to mention for you that in this slide, I concentrated some of the issues you addressed in the last, uh, the previous question. When we began to talk about Paris diplomacy, I was not able to join you, but I took some of your questions and I tried to address them here in this slide because by coincidence, I, I thought that in this part of the seventh question, they, they uh, fit uh, better to be addressed here. So uh, foreign policy, uh, could we say that foreign policy is a monopoly of the union of the central government? We used to, to th this terminology, to begin this terminology, foreign policy, we used to relate to to the national government, to the central government. We don't have, uh, it's not common to say, oh, a city have a foreign policy, oh, a province have a, has a, pro a foreign policy. But um, I would say, uh, based on my, my research and what I, I think, uh, based on this research, what I think how things work, um, that cities have their local foreign policy and also states and provinces. If we call this foreign policy or not, is another thing. But the fact is that some or most of cities and, and provinces and states that play some kind of role uh, with party diplomacy, we can see a certain kind of foreign policy. Uh, then we can say regional local foreign policy, we can say federative foreign policy, city foreign policy, state, provincial, region, lender foreign policy, because uh, I think the literature should be more open to, uh, um, to encompass this terminology. Uh, and it is not, uh, still is not. Now, which is in different color, is the question, are the questions that you posed uh, in the previous uh, classroom. And I'd like to make some comments on that. Very good ones. And I, I appreciate and I, I thank you for that. So um, there is a, a, one of this, those comments uh, was regarding the decentralization cooperation and the principle of subsidiarity. No. In, in, in European Union, there is the principle of subsidiarity or the subsidiarity principle. 
which is a principle that uh, sta states that local makes better what central government uh, could be, could, could, could do. So there is a common understanding that the local government should do uh, what, uh, what local asks to be done. Uh, so in, in partner diplomacy, it's very important the, the subsidiary principle. And in Latin America, we call this the decentralization uh, principle. We don't call this subsidiarity principle because it's not part of our legal terminology. Then we will find union plus local entities. Um, because one of the comments or questions you made was, is it possible a common uh, relationship between union and local uh, entities to have uh, uh, in, in part of diplomacy. Yes, it's it's uh, po it's possible, uh, especially when we talk about borders, border issues, and also specific issues regarding some treaties, because two uh, different nations can sign a treaty, and in this treaty can have provisions for subnational governments. We see this, for instance, uh, in the case of Brazil and France. We have, we have a treaty between Brazil and France, and there are some provisions regarding uh, the French Guiana, which is the uh, Département du Tramet uh, from France, and the uh, state of Amapá, because it's, uh, it's the state that uh, have, uh, has borders with the French Guiana. So, we can see some kind of party diplomacy, but used not to be called like that. The, the terminology used more common is the centralized cooperation that put together localities and the central or federal union. This is one of the questions that you made and I'd like to comment. The other is issues that has to do with the national foreign policy. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, are there some issues that local governments should not play any role with party diplomacy? I think this was more or less the question. Yes, um, this is not expressed, uh, but we can uh, ha we have some consensus uh, that uh, international security recognition of states and governments is not part of the autonomous competence of a city, of a, of a province, of uh, a federative state uh, to perform with para diplomacy. Even a declaration could be dangerous in case of some international relations regarding central governments. Of course, that this is not so is not so uh, wide a list of issues because today many of the issues regarding national governments like education, health, um, and others, uh, transportation, uh, links with link with uh, with local governments. But uh, we can uh, link this uh, comment or question with another uh, regarding the the control of para diplomacy is para diplomacy uh, could be para diplomacy controlled by by central governments well central governments try to monitoring para diplomacy because in different countries like canada like spain they they are aware of the potential uh may be dangerous of, uh, of uh, separatism, of uh, independentism of those provinces. But in other countries, this control is much more related to what we call the constitutionality control. Because in, in different public policies, if a subnational government goes beyond uh, its limit, a uh, city, a state, a province, there is the con constitutional control which is part of the judiciary branch. And it's, uh, it's not, the control is not from union uh, controlling the states and cities. It's also the inverse. 
the cities can, can also control the union if the union go beyond goes beyond the their limits the constitutional limits so cons uh, here the constitution is important and also the judiciary courts and i would like uh, also to mention that parliaments could control um, in many democracies subnational governments and the union itself as part of uh, its role uh, of controlling uh, the checks and balances uh, system of uh, of the democracies i would like to mention to find to finally a case of the u.s supreme court which is a very paradigmatic case important one which was the crosby versus national foreign trade council in 2000 what was the Crosby versus National Foreign Trade Council? The history was the following. Uh, the state of Massachusetts in the US approved it in 96, a law a bill that uh, established sanctions, see, sanctions against Myanmar because of the violations of human rights in Myanmar. Uh, what, what the federal union, what the unions, uh, said at that point in the US. It's not allowed for Massachusetts to approve such a law to establish sanctions against Myanmar because this is foreign policy. This is monopoly of the state. And then um, the, the union filled a, a, a action against uh, the, the state of Massachusetts. And in 2000, the Supreme Court decided that the law of Massachusetts was unconstitutional. So the law was suspended because the Supreme Court recognized that that issue of sanctions against another country is not part of the competence of a state, a federative state, or even a city. It's only part of a foreign policy. So this, I think, is, is very enlightening, this case, because I think the, the case sheds light to this uh, uh, dilemma in the, what is foreign policy uh, like monopoly of, of the central government, what is not. I think this, this case is, is important and very illustrative of that. Um, finally, the eighth question, and we are coming to our the end of our presentation. How does fighting global warming and the COVID-19 pandemic drive Paris policy. Um, in my book, I try to analyze recent movements on, on both uh, great fields, one of the environment or the pandemic, that drive it by diplomacy in different ways. And I would say in a more hard way, I call that hard part diplomacy in, in opposition of soft part diplomacy. In hard times, hard part diplomacy. So we are living now a hard time of climate change and also for, of, of pandemic. Of, of course, that we are now much more in a, in a more stable control with vaccines. But two years or one year ago, we are in a very emergency situation regarding pandemic. And what happened there? Uh, climate change has a lot of local impact. If you see the, uh, the level of oceans that will change in some 20, 30, 40 years, and will cover part of cities that not today are not covered by, by the ocean. So the impact is local. Um, and when we see that some national governments are against to uh, invest in prevention and mitigation of climate change, then we can understand uh, why some cities and local governments are so furious, are so um, shaken by the fact that they have to do something by themselves, even either individually or better in multilateral uh, networks, like as we mentioned, the C40 plus. Uh, local measures also has uh, have to be done uh, with in the case of climate change 
in this case, the World Bank, the IDB, and other uh, international agencies, also the private sector could support localities, cities, and provinces to act with local measures. And as I mentioned, the international networks um, play a very important role in that. Talking about COVID-19, uh, in different countries, we had different uh, reactions to, to the pandemic. Uh, by lucky, we most of the countries were some uh, kind of coordination between central governments and subnational ones to face the pandemic COVID. It was, for instance, what happened in Germany, uh, as we could follow between the, the federal government and lander and cities. In, in most of the time we, we saw this happening. But in case of Brazil and maybe other countries like India, it, it, does, it didn't happen. And so in Brazil, uh, we have to have uh, cities and states action because the union, the federal union, the president was not act acting uh, as expected to do. And then the Supreme Court in the case of Brazil uh, allowed subnational actions to, uh, uh, to, to react to the pandemic in the absence of federal uh, action. So it was very important uh, decision of the Supreme Court in April 20 that allowed uh, cities and, and, pro and, and state, federative states to act uh, despite of the, the federal government uh, didn't act accordingly to the constitution, to the public policies what to expect. And the other thing important to mention is that Sao Paulo state uh, has a, an institute called Butantan Institute. The, the Butantan Institute is a very, it's, it's a 100 years institute. It's a, it's a long-term existent uh, institute of scientific one uh, that produces vaccines very kinds of vaccines. And the Butantan Institute uh, signed an agreement with the Sinovac Biotech, which is the Chinese in, uh, company that produces vaccine. And this, um, this agreement was an agreement of uh, technology transfer and also to sell vaccines. And the, the vaccine CoronaVac, which is the vaccine uh, made by the Instituto, Butantan Institute in Sao Paulo, all this negotiation, all the agreement was made uh, without any kind of uh, union or federal government intervention. And the first vaccine that we had in Brazil was not from the federal government, was the Sao Paulo government vaccine, was the CoronaVac, with the agreement with the Chinese government. It was a very important, I would say for lives, not only importance for prior diplomacy, but for lives that this uh, agreement was made between a state in Brazil, the Sao Paulo state, which is the richest one, and the, the Chinese company, uh, Sinovac Biotech. This was a very interesting and good example of how paradiplomacy could be, uh, including in, par in pandemic situations, could be very important and useful, uh, especially when the central government uh, was not acting accordingly. Uh, well, this is the book that we contributed, Comparative Federalism and COVID-19, Combating the Pandemic. There is a chapter here, uh, then I will offer the, the access, this is free access, you can see the book uh, free uh, in our references, we will find that. Uh, and also I would like to, to share with you uh, a, a, a journal this journal is, is mainly in Spanish. You can find some articles in French, some articles in Portuguese, but it's mainly in Spanish. If you, if you are interested and able to, to read in Spanish, I will recommend it. And I think Priscilla also mentioned in the, in the last uh, classroom about that, which is uh, may, uh, produced by Paradiplomacia uh, Period Org, which is an NGO. This NGO produces the journal TIP. The, the, it's uh, Trabajos de Investigación in Paradiplomacy. Uh, is uh, research works in paradiplomacy, the translation. It's free, 
you can you, you can access uh, and also it's our in our reference here you you find uh, the the TIP uh, and some of the references you use for this presentation. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, your patience, and I'm I'm very glad. Uh, to be at your disposal for a dialogue uh, following this presentation. Thank you, Professor Glauser Perez. And this wave of nationalism uh, is not uh, in favor, in general, of paradiplomacy. It's much more a, a, a movement that uh, wants to concentrate again power in the hands of the president, or in some cases in the in the hands of military. So the militarization of uh, of governments in some in some cases are leading for a, a, a shock of legitimacy, as, as we mentioned with the, the Alangayon concept. Uh, that maybe we can we, we will see in the in the near future more conflicts on that because you know in in Brazil we had the pandemic we had a conflict between the central government and the subnational governments that was resolved by the Supreme Court and the central government recognized the legitimacy and the legality of that but in cases that the the central government does not recognize, then we have a big conflict. Because then the central government can say, I, I, I will not allow this kind of things. In the case of Brazil, we had the conflict between Bolsonaro and the Chinese government without any justification, without any reason, because Brazil export 30% of the exportation of the trade, the national trade of Brazil is with China. There was no reason for the conflict, but it was an ideological reason that drives the President Bolsonaro to be against China, uh, in creating obstacles for other relationships. But the Sao Paulo state uh, ignored that and took the advantage to have, including to have an office in Shanghai, because the Sao Paulo state had an office in Shanghai, and uh, made the deal with the Chinese. For us, it was a very important issue because brought us the vaccine, the CoronaVac vaccine, which was the first vaccine that was distributed in the country. So, uh, of course, that it's it's a very partial answer I give you, Sebastian, because we can we can uh, take different variables to to explain how para diplomacy is becoming more and more important uh, in the last thirty years. We, uh, I, I mentioned the, the three variables that Michael Keating used to, to point it out, like uh, political, economic, and cultural. But we, we can add different variables on this equation to explain how city, uh, why cities and why provinces and states are going uh, through the international scene, the international arena, uh, with or without the central government. This is the, the point.